Thousands of years ago, Sigurd I built incredible engines of war, and with them, forged an empire. The emperor married and sired many children. He even had a love child with mysterious Aurora, an ancient dragon in a woman's guise. Once united, peace was declared in Rivalon, and bloodshed soon forgotten. But Sigurd's realm of peace was shattered when his own sons and daughters rose against him. War returned with a vengeance, and annihilation reached new heights. Desperate to safeguard Sigurd's legacy, the wizard Maxos sought the help of the one child that never betrayed his father. Sigurd and Aurora's son, the half-dragon prince. He would be the one to save the empire from ruin, and to aid him in his quest, Maxos delivered unto him the imperial command ship known as the Raven. This is the story of Maxos and the Dragon. This is the story of the Dragon Commander. Welcome, noble dragon, to the Raven. This wonder of engineering, this miracle wrought in magic that has a living demon for a heart. Between the knowledge I shall pry from this infernal creature's cryptic mind and the avalanche of tomes, manuscripts, and blueprints aboard awaiting study, we will catch up with our enemies in no time and claim back the lands they have taken by force. Our task is monumental, but we will not have to face it alone. Two famed generals are here already, loyal to the legacy we are trying to save, and therefore loyal to you, given time. I have furthermore enlisted the service of Grumio, an imp of devilish cunning that can fashion anything my research will uproot. Already he has created you a wonder he calls a jet pack. Talk to these men, get your bearings, and begin your conquest. If you have any more questions, you can find me in the Royal Chamber, which I shall use as a study. Good luck, Dragon. May the Divines be with you. Let me tell your right of the bat, bastard, that I hold you in very little regard. Your father may have been a great king once, but this last decade, a crowned pig would have played the part better. He became a vainglorious fool, a sloth, and a coward. No wonder then that his own children could amass armies unperceived and strike at the heart of a kingdom in a matter of days. He tried to run but he failed, and they slew him where he stood. Now the realm has been shattered, and vultures are picking what they can from his corpse by means of new and terrifying war machines. I'd say all is lost, but Maxos insists you are to be the one, the hero who will take back the land we've lost. Excuse me if I laugh in derision. Ha! <laughs> Still. You are a dragon, I'll give you that, and of ancient blood. Prove to me you have the rocks to do undaunted battle, and perhaps my respect may still be yours. Henry of the House of Lancefoot. More you needn't know. Edmund, he's called. A lizard of the House of Carcharus. In truth, I'd rather sleep with Syphilis Incarna than have him aboard, but there's no denying his talent. He's as arrogant as he is astute, and as ingenious as he is insufferable. Why don't you offer him a word of welcome? I know I won't. I believe he's in the bar. Probably searching for Sherry, just about the only drink that snooty serpent will swill. Aye, and you have titles as well, but none of them king. 
as yet. I'll address you with the right regard the day you prove worthy of it. And there we have it, I suppose. The dragon son of a monarch deposed. Rightful heir to the throne, even if he was born out of wedlock. No doubt that bore of a Henry has already introduced me in his ever-elegant way. So here I am. Lord Edmund Augustus III, Duke of Hawknest Hall. I'd add, at your service, but I don't think we're quite there yet. To be perfectly honest, I'd normally entertain the idea of lending my expertise to your cause as curtly as I'd consider attending a dwarven opera. But not unlike my fellow general, it is Maxos's backing of this enterprise that has me intrigued. You have doubts benefit, Dragon. Let's see how far it takes you. When one dwells among the highest echelons of power, where ambition runs thicker than blood, distrust is your best friend, as is its brother, Caution. In your case, though, the waters of misgiving run somewhat deeper. You are, after all, but a half-dragon. They call your kind Dragon Knights to lend an air of nobility to a lowly mixed breed. Not many make the distinction even, but the crucial difference is in purity. Human ancestry taints your being, for humanity and weakness are two sides of the same tuppence I drop in beggars' hats. A bastard twice are you, my lord. Bastard born and bastard bred. Only that it was bound to happen. For when an emperor weakens, his empire weakens with him. Now a litter of dogs is fighting for the throne, so maybe their dragon half-brother can walk away with it. Greeting, sire, sprung from kings. I am Grumio, son of Grumio, an imp of good and honest standing. Your technician shall I be, if it pleases you. Your engineer and architect. I hope you'll like my jetpack. It is my gift to you, to keep without recompense, for gladly shall I remain aboard this wondrous ship to tinker and toy, hammer and hew. She is special, this vessel, filled with wonders undiscovered. The wizard, he feels it too. The taste, the tingle of mystery. Oh, to unlock its secrets. Let's ready the tools, my lord. Oh, lovely to see you, my lord. You can get a bit lonely here on the engineering bay. Well, my lord, when your good father and Maxos first started to conquer the world with their fancy machines, we emps were mesmerised. None of us cared if we were being drafted into a strange warlord's empire, for if those were the weapons he wielded, we were all ready to welcome him with open arms. By golly, were we ever. Steam-driven giants on land, on sea, even in air. Oh, the ecstasy! Such wonders, such ingenuity, and jeepers, what cannons. Ever since then, 
Some 30 years hence, us imps have dedicated our existence to the advancement of these delightful machines. Now, before those blessed days arrived, people regarded us as eccentric gnomes taken to experimenting with flame, gas and liquid like so many charlatan alchemists, but <laughs> those days are over. We are scientists now, famed and fortuitous. The truth be told, though, we, we've never quite given up our love for all things combustible. Rather on the contrary. Not that you mind, do you, my lord? Never hesitate to seek my counsel, Dragon Knight. Tirelessly I study and question in the knowledge that my discoveries will make you the mightiest dragon ever to have soared the skies. We too shall unite Dragon's daring with Wizard's wisdom. Nothing shall stand in your way. That is quite a tale, my friend, so bear with me. Since the dawn of time, beautiful Rivalon has been a stage of bitter rivalry, strife, and war. Haughty humans, all too lofty lizards, dogged dwarves, erratic elves, irrational imps, dogmatic, undead, and yes, wayward wizards even, couldn't forego the time it takes for the moon to wax and wane without turning to fresh violence. Peace. The word itself hardly had a meaning. It was an abstract until after long and dark ages, three men decided they had had enough. I was one of them. The other two were your father Sigurd, and an eccentric inventor known only, even by us, as the architect. We knew war would continue everlasting unless one king would stand up, conquer all feuding factions, and unite the manifold battling races under the banner of a single, world-spanning empire. Easier said than done was, I believe, our initial reaction. It was the architect who provided us with the answer to the question how on earth we would go about enacting such an unparalleled enterprise. He said he had ways and means to provide your father, a battle-hardened warlord in his own right, with engines of war such as the world never saw. Technology, that was the solution. For if we could go to war with weapons so vastly superior as to be unstoppable, every opponent would have to yield before our onslaught. Where the architect obtained his strange knowledge from, he never wished to reveal. But in truth, Sigurd and I cared little for his mysterious ways. For whatever the source, our plans worked like a charm. And in a matter of years, Rivalon was ours. Yes, we had done it. We had created our empire, and your father became its first and so far only ruler. For a few precious decades, peace had finally taken on a meaning. It was a bright flash, all too quickly extinguished along the tenebrous continuum of time. Long have I asked myself that question, yet the answer is as simple as it is obvious. Human nature. Love, jealousy, anger, grief. All of these emotions proved more fatal to the stability of peace than a hundred thousand war machines could. You see, Sigurd, the architect and I, remained close friends after our quest had come to completion. But then, one fateful day, a woman of unequaled beauty arrived at court. After but a glance, there wasn't a man's heart in the room, not aching for even her mildest attention or a most fleeting caress. Your father, though married, courted her, as did the architect. 
For myself, I'd admit I'd given up the very secrets of magic in return for her love, but I knew rivalry could only lead to misery. And so it did. For bitter rivals, my two friends became. And when, in the end, Sigurd was the one to win her affections, the architect left the palace with such hatred in his eyes as to strike me as diabolical. A year their secret liaison lasted. One year your father and beautiful Aurora were happy together. Then suddenly she died. And it took me a long time to find out she did so at the hand of the architect. Sigurd never knew. He was destroyed by grief. The mighty warlord withered, and with him, the soul of his empire flickered like a candle in the breeze, until his own children blew it out forever and hacked to pieces the land that was to have been his legacy. I promise I will tell you in due time. For now, I must keep silent. Please, don't press me any further on the subject. Though I said I noticed from the beginning her beauty was of such perfection as to be supernatural, I soon discovered she was indeed more than human, and that the enchanting guise we saw her in was but a mask. Behind it lurked the dragon. Yes, she was one of the ancients, interested in the ways of the infinitely lesser creatures we nevertheless call civilized. She was intrigued by Sigurd, his war machines, and his empire. It led her to his castle, to a brief spell of passion, and ultimately, a downfall. No one in Rivalon, save for you, Sigurd, the architect, and I, know of Aurora, and how her death affected your father. As far as most are concerned, he was a great hero, who all too soon fell prey to indulgence, sloth, and alcohol, which lost him the affection of his children and in time started the war. They are wrong, but truth will be revealed one day. Rest assured that when we finish our conquest and I can spend some leisure time in peace, I will write his history and yours too. Everyone shall know the tragedy that befell him and how his son, by the woman he loved, rose to save an empire. In a few words, victory and destruction First, we must vanquish all warring rivals for the throne. Then, we must undo the technology that enabled them to go to war in the first place. We will rekindle the Empire of Peace your father founded and be rid of the apparatus that might threaten it once more.
Yes, Commander. Got to load the cannons before you fire them, Commander. Just like we've some conquering to do before we can assess the situation. So hey, don't let me stop you. Let's get started, Commander. Now, to navigate your camera, simply use the movement keys. To look around, hold the middle mouse button and move your mouse in the direction you want to look. To command a unit to move somewhere, left-click on the desired unit to select it and right-click on the destination you want it to go to. You can select multiple units by holding the left mouse button and dragging a selection rectangle around them. Right-click to make them go somewhere, or unselect them by clicking left. I see you've selected a building. When you select a building, a menu appears which allows you to create new units. Here I've selected a battle forge, which allows me to create troopers and or grenadiers. To build new units, you need to capture construction sites and manufacture buildings there first. I could build another battle forge, for instance, or create a war factory, which will allow me to make new types of units, like armors and devastators. To build units and buildings, you'll need recruits. 
Your initial amount of recruits depends on the total population of any given country. How many are available to you is listed on the left side of your status bar next to the country's population. To get more recruits, you need to build recruitment citadels. You can build more recruitment citadels on these special resource construction sites. The more recruitment citadels you have, the faster new recruits will come in. It'll be built in a jiffy. You're a dragon, aren't you, Commander? So you'll want to turn into one and aid your troops in combat. To turn into a dragon, press the Dragon Morph button, which will allow you to materialize at the current camera location. To move your dragon, use your movement keys. And to move in a certain direction, just point your mouse in the direction you want to go to. To navigate rapidly over the battlefield, hold the Jetpack button, which will make you speed across the terrain. To attack an enemy unit, click on it with the left mouse button and barrage it with fireballs. To dodge enemy projectiles, hold the right mouse button to dodge sideways. Your dragon has multiple skills which are executed by pressing the skill buttons. Should your dragon die in combat, you will be able to restore it to life by pressing the dragon morph button once more. This will come at a certain cost in recruits, mind you. Forge completed. The Emperor shows us the way.
Commander's enemy is my enemy. Your unit will roll out momentarily, Commander. Can we build a engine, ready to follow you, even into death. Bring me the spoils of war! in progress. Now for some advanced techniques, Commander. It is possible for you to control your units while you're in dragon form. You can select units in your direct vicinity by pressing the assigned key. Here, for instance, I've selected a group of units and indicated that they need to go and capture that shipyard over there, while I fly off to do something else, like shooting these annoying troopers. There are many shortcuts in Dragon Commander, but it pays to learn them all, to optimally enjoy the game and rule the skies. Walking Beer King, reporting for duty. Anti-ground turret completed. There is no reason to doubt your insight, sir. Anti-ground turret completed. Thank you. 
great dragon, glorious warlord. Once more you return from the battlefield red with the blood of slain adversaries. And let me tell you, these victories of yours have not gone by unnoticed. In fact, to my great satisfaction, another pair of dauntless generals has joined our company. Four military masterminds are now on board, more than enough to start a campaign of conquest on a truly grand scale. No doubt you're as anxious to meet them as they are to meet you. So why don't you go to the throne room, where I've instructed them to await your arrival? Heavens no. You have the military firmly on your side. But civil emissaries too are bound to join our cause in due time. Indeed, I expect you'll be declared Emperor before long. Yes, you heard me correctly. Emperor. It is inevitable. People have heard of you. The Dragon. Their one hope of deliverance from war, oppression and death. Soon hope will turn into confidence. And when ambassadors of the civilized races flock to the Raven, your political career will commence. You yourself will of course represent all humans. But the Dwarves, Elves, Lizards, Imps, and Undead will want their say as well, and more. Still, let us worry about politics later. Today, it is your generals that count. It's wondrous, my lord. Wondrous! The Raven, she speaks to me in my dreams. She tells me fantastic things, newfangled and new formed. I can make them all for you if you provide the right resources. Indeed she does, my lord. A soft voice sings inside my head, but only when I'm in the land of eyes shut and mind at rest. There she guides me to glory. Shows me things not even wizards could dream of. Yes, 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 but don't remind me. My heart bleeds just thinking about it. Oh, but I must be like a chef, don't I? I must create delicate wonders, impeccable blends of perfection in the knowledge they must all turn into wretched clumps of waste destined for the sewer. It's a thankless thing I do, but I must remind myself the fun lies in creation, not completion. Can't be helped, my lord. My Lord Dragon, allow me to present your team of generals. Edmund, you already know, but I now have the pleasure of introducing you to Her Highness Lady Catherine, Queen of Westbridge, and Scarlet, not noble of birth, but the more so of heart. We four have pledged we will stand by you in your conquest as a rightful heir to Revelon's throne. Bastard no longer. You shall be known as Commander until the day comes that you shall be king. All hail the dragon. Hail. Hail. Yes, well, hail. Yes, Commander. Seemed hardly proper to call you by that particular pet name on what was somewhat of an official occasion. But don't worry. I may still slip up once or twice, even though my respect for you is in fact growing. You've got a knack for bloody brutal battle, and Faint Hard never won fair victory. It's going to take some getting used to, you know, to call you Commander. Verily, I was rather opposed to the notion, but Maxos in his infinite wisdom insisted we up the level of common courtesy toward you. Commoner would have done. Commander, though, it shall be. As much as it is in the eagle's nature to look down upon the world in hunt of lesser creatures, it is my genius that makes me soar high above all others. Lesser creatures, indeed. 
At the lone top do I reside, but I would have it no other way. Those who do not understand, all but everyone, calls me a loner, thinking the word to be a pejorative. But it is on the contrary glorious to live in sweet isolation when all around you non-lizards, that is to say inferiors, skitter and crawl like vermin. I am a solitudinarian, for my nature makes me so. And when I do have contact with those I loathe, inevitably I talk down to them as it is impossible to communicate on a level of equality when there is none to be had. How's it hanging, Commander? I'm Scarlet, and you're a dragon, they tell me. Always wanted to ride one of those, though I bet you're a little harder to handle than a horse. All part of the fun, though, I reckon, so uh, give me a shout when I can take you for a spin. Treat me mean, I'll scratch your eyes out. Treat me well, and I'll purr like a kitten. Your choice, Commander. I would say it is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Commander. But as it stands, I must approach you with a bit of reserve. True, to know we have a dragon knight for a leader is a great relief, for such a grand creature inspires bravado in the many hearts that will have to be won so that we may overthrow the spreading dark. But then again, you are the offspring, the male offspring to boot, of a sorry line prone to decadence and corruption. The very line, in fact, that is responsible for the downfall of the Empire in the first place. Forgive me then if I do wonder, Will this commander pass muster, earn his wings, earn his crown? Because they call us females the fairer sex. But in truth, we are also more cunning, resilient, refined, and downright intelligent. Give an empire a queen, I say, and it will be ruled. Give it a king, and it will become an afterthought. For like any man, he is content when both his belly and his bed are filled with a prize piece of tender flesh. No more. Men are simple creatures, Commander, and should therefore be in charge of simple things only. 